Welcome back, everybody. We are on our very last learning module for the semester, just in time for me to figure out how to make this uh, full screen effect happen. All right, let's jump into it. We're talking about judgment and decision making and cognitive biases. Here's what's in store. Uh, first of all, there's no textbook readings. We've run out of the textbook for this course. I do have one assigned empirical article, and you can go and get that on Blackboard. It's right here, uh, the effect of background case characteristics on decisions in the delivery room from the Journal of Medical Decision Making. Make sure you go ahead and read that article. It's pretty short, and there's some quiz questions on it, and it will appear on the final exam. Okay. So judgment and decision making. Um, here's a few general questions that this area of cognition is interested in answering. So questions like how do people judge, evaluate, and assess information in their environment? How do people make choices? And what influences people's judgments and decisions? Let's talk about some everyday examples here. So you could consider how it is that you go about making judgments and decisions in your everyday life. I'm going to come up with two kinds of scenarios. I wonder if these are familiar to you. Here's one, buying a new whatever, a new X. I recently bought some new stuff and here's how I did it. I researched the options on the web. I watched lots of informative YouTube videos. I asked some friends who knew about this thing I wanted to buy. I started making, you know, there's lots of options. So I started making some lists about some good reasons to buy this option or bad reasons to buy this option. And after I figured out all the information, did all my research, I finally bought the thing I was looking for. It took a long time, a lot of effort, but I think that I, um, did the best I could to, to get the thing that I needed. So that's like one kind of scenario. And sometimes maybe you, uh, you know, make your decisions this way in a thoughtful, careful, research oriented, try to gather all the information you need. How about uh, other times when you say buy something else? You might have a spur of the moment feeling, you might just like the thing, you might buy it for no good reason. Who's to say? exactly why you did that, you know? I think this is a nice way to think about um, a general distinction in the judgment and decision-making literature. And this is the idea that our judgments and decisions can be made in more or less controlled ways. We've come across this controlled versus automatic distinction in previous lectures. So I'll just reiterate it here. A controlled approach to making judgments and decisions could be slow and effortful. It would require some deliberation on your part, and it likely employs some kind of reasoning process where you're gathering information you can trust and using that information to uh, the best of your ability, making your decision. Another way to make judgments and decisions could be on, an, on a more automatic basis. This would be fast and easy, potentially even unconscious, and it might reflect some habits you've developed. So you could make choices based off of basically the way you did it before. All right. Now I forgot to mention uh, this last lecture, I'm gonna to try to make it shorter than normal. I sometimes say at the beginning of these lectures that, oh, here's a little mini lecture, it'll be 20 minutes, it ends up being 40 minutes and two parts, uh, 40 to 50 minutes each. So considering we're at the end of the semester, I'm gonna to try to give us all a break. We're in at four minutes right now, four and a half minutes. I'm hoping to actually finish this in about 20, 25 minutes. And what that means is we're not going to get a chance to really take a deep dive into all that the judgment and decision-making literature has to offer. We're going to do a deep dive into two papers by Kahneman and Tversky from 1972 and 1973. And to give you some broader idea of some things that are going on in this literature, 
I'm going to make an assignment around this thing right here, these cognitive biases. So when we're thinking about how we make our judgments and decisions, it turns out research shows there's many biases that shape how we make judgments and decisions. There's a big long list that is maintained on Wikipedia, and I like to link to this list and take a look at it, partly because it's so long and you get to see, oh wow, there's a lot of different influences apparently on how people make judgments and decisions. So for example, here are some of them. We've got the anchoring bias, the availability heuristic. We're going to talk about this one in class today. Cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, egocentric bias, extension neglect, false priors, framing effect. And you know, within each of these, are, there's a whole bunch of them. So like the contrast effect, the decoy effect, the default effect, the denomination effect, the blah, blah, blah effect. There's so many uh, interesting biases that can come into play that shape our judgments and decisions. If you're interested in exploring some of those, go check out the Wikipedia page, but also check out the optional assignment for this learning module. And it's around um, helping you explore some of those things and learn more about them. Um, one, here's a few general notes because we're, we're gonna explore two different cognitive biases today. I think if we get here, we're gonna talk about the availability heuristic and the representative representativeness heuristic. Uh, so we'll take a, take a look at those two. But before we do that, uh, here's a few things I want to say about cognitive biases in general. Uh, one, it's useful to be aware of potential biases to our own personal judgment and decision-making processes. Two, these biases are not necessarily bad or wrong, um, and they often can reflect the operation of basic cognitive processes. So we could also learn st stuff about how cognition works uh, through th these bias processes. All right. So the rest of this lecture is going to be talking about two particular biases and this notion of heuristics in judgment and decision making. So a heuristic is a rule of thumb that often works quite well in, say, approximating some information. We're talking about the availability heuristic and the representativeness heuristic that are potentially used when people have to make judgments about subjective probability or judgments about frequency. We're going to look at these two papers here. The first one is by Kahneman and Tversky from 1972 called Subjective Probability, a Judgment of Representativeness. <laughs> Wish I could say that better. Representativeness. Oof. Well, I just spent a long time saying that word over and over again. I'm, I can't do it any better. The second paper is from 1973. It's the same authors, Tversky and Kahneman, on availability. This is a heuristic for judging frequency and probability. So actually, both of these papers are about making judgments about probability and frequency, and they're talking about two heuristics that people might use when they make those judgments. This is a little picture of the two psychologists, Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman. Here's a book by Daniel Kahneman, a recent one called Thinking Fast and Slow. Notably, Kahneman was a winner of the Nobel Prize in economics for some of the work he did in psychology. And actually, if you're interested in a story about these two, they had a pretty big impact on research in judgment and decision-making. And uh, a recent book by Michael Lewis is called The Undoing Project, A Friendship That Changed Our Minds. And it talks about uh, these two psychologists and 
some of the backstory behind the research that it they, that they did. And what we're going to do today is look at some of that research. So here's, for example, the first paper from 1972. We'll look at that. But before we do that, let's talk about judgments of frequency and probability. Now, here's the first question. How many words do you know? I don't know how many words I know. It, it's not really clear how we would ever figure this out. Um, but you should be able to just sit here and reflect on this yourself and come up with a, a subjective estimate. For example, you probably know more than five words, so you wouldn't say five. And you probably don't know a billion words, that's too many. What, what number would you place it at? Uh, maybe I know 75,000 words. I could come up with the number. I just made a judgment of frequency. And how did I do that? What information did I use to do that? You know, I, I didn't sit here and count all the words that I know and got to 75,000 and said, well, it's 75,000. I, I did something else. I, I just kind of made up a number. Um, second question, what are the chances you will receive more than two calls from a telemarketer today? So this is a question about probability of something that could happen to you. And how would you come up with that uh, type of estimate? And people can do these things. Um, it's not necessarily clear that their estimates will be accurate or correct, but it's something that people have the ability to make judgments about. So the next two papers we're going to talk about are one perspective on how people might make these judgments of frequency and probability. And this, perspective, uh, this particular perspective is, is rooted in the idea that when people make these judgments, they might be influenced by some general ways that learning and memory processes work. So for example, uh, when I think about the second question, what are the chances that I'll receive more than two calls from a telemarketer today? Well, that whole situation reminds me Yesterday, I got some calls from a telemarketer. It just like pops in my head. This reminds me of those situations. So that situation's available in my head. And I was like, well, it's probably, I guess it happened yesterday. Probably happened today too. Maybe it's a good chance because I can easily think of an example. So because something reminded me of the situation, um, that's influencing my subjective judgments. And uh, Kahneman and Tversky wrote some influential papers looking at uh, some of these general influences. So here's the first one, subjective probability, a judgment of representativeness. Yes, we'll go with that, representativeness. Let's read the abstract. So this paper explores a heuristic, representativeness, according to which the subjective probability of an event or a sample is determined by the degree to which it, one, is similar in essential characteristics to its parent population, and two, reflects the salient features of the process by which it is generated. This heuristic is explicated in a series of empirical examples demonstrating predictable and systematic errors in the evaluation of uncertain events. In particular, since sample size does not represent any property of the population, it is expected to have little or no effect on judgment of likelihood. This prediction is confirmed in studies showing that subjective sampling distributions and posterior probability judgments are determined by the most salient characteristics of the sample without regard to the size of the sample. Uh, the present heuristic approach is contrasted with the normative approach to the analysis of the judgment of uncertainty. So there's a lot going on in that abstract. Let's jump into uh, some of the ways we're going to gloss over this paper. So here's the big question and idea. Here's a big question is how do people judge frequencies and probabilities? And, and the basic idea here is that 
uh, people might use heuristics that are usually good approximations to the thing they're trying to judge. The heuristic that they're investigating is this representativeness heuristic. What that is, is that people will judge frequencies and probabilities essentially based on whether the thing they're judging is similar to the category it came from. Whether it represents, it's a good representative example of the category it came from. And this could be like a little shortcut that people use. If people use the shortcut, shortcut uh, you should be able to find evidence that they're doing so. So some implications uh, of this idea are that if people use the representativeness heuristic, then decisions about frequency and probability should be biased by representative examples. In this paper, Kahneman and Tversky presented several examples where simple judgments about frequency and probability were biased by representativeness. Let's see some examples. I'm going to do two of them. The first one is this one right here, similarity of sample to population. Now, they ran a bunch of fun experiments and a lot of them looked a lot like this. You give people a little uh, question like this and say, which make your answer. And this is how they went on with the paper. So imagine you have to give an answer to this question. What's the question? All families of six children in a city were surveyed. In 72 families, the exact order of births of boys and girls was G, B, G, B, B, G. All right. The question is, what is your estimate of the number of families surveyed in which the exact order of births was B, G, B, 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 B? Question mark. Kind of a funny question. Uh, we could pause here and say, like, well, what number would you give? Took me a little while to realize what they were asking, but it's like, imagine, okay, we got um, New York City here or Brooklyn. So if we found all of the families right now that have six children, um, apparently, we, I mean, let's imagine that 72 of them had the GBG, BBG order. Okay, so how many of the families had the BG, BBBB B, B order? That's up to you to guess. Here's what they point out. The two birth sequences are about equally likely, but most people will surely agree that they are not equally representative. The sequence with five boys and one girl fails to reflect the proportion of boys and girls in the population. This one right here. What they report is that 75 out of 92 subjects who judged this sequence, they judged the sequence to be less likely than the standard sequence. So when people were given this question, they estimated that about 30 families would have had this birth sequence. So they gave a lower number of an estimate. I mean, people could have, uh, people should have probably given a, a number closer to 72 because the expectation should be that they're about the same. Uh, but people systematically gave a lower number and they're their explanation for this finding is that people look at this sequence and they 
form their judgment based on how similar this sequence is to a sequence they think would be random. This one doesn't look very random. So they think it will not happen very often because it's not very representative. It doesn't look like the thing they're expecting. Here's another example of, of something similar. Um, Here's the scenario that were give, was given to participants. So in each round of a game, 20 marbles are distributed at random among five children, Alan, Ben, Carl, Dan, and Ed. So here's two things that could have happened. The first one is Alan got four, Ben got four, Carl got five, Dan got four, Ed got three. Another scenario is that everybody got four marbles. So here's the question. Imagine we keep playing this game over and over and over and over, always dividing the marbles between these kids. In many rounds of the game, will there be more results of type one? Will this happen more? Or of type two, will this happen more? You could sit here and make a guess yourself which one would happen more. So they point out that the uniform distribution of marbles, this one right here, is objectively more probable than the non-uniform distribution. That's this one. So this number two should happen more than this number one. However, this one over here appears too lawful to be the result of a random process. Whereas this one over here, because there's two numbers that depart slightly from an equal partition, is more similar to or more representative of what people would think a random process would do. And what they report is a significant majority of subjects, 36 out of 52, viewed this first distribution as being more probable than the second distribution. So this is a bias. People, the correct answer would be number two and uh, Kahneman and Tversky are arguing that people are biased to pick the sequence that looks more random based off of the representativeness heuristic. In 1973, the same authors published another paper. And in this paper, they focused on something called the availability heuristic. So this is not about whether something is similar to what you expect. It's just about whether you can think about the thing. Is it easy to think about or not? So they're going to suggest that the ease with which you can bring examples to mind will influence your judgments of frequencies and probabilities. We can read through the abstract. So this paper explores a judgmental heuristic in which a person evaluates the frequency or classes of the probability of events by availability. That is by the ease with which relevant instances come to mind. In general, availability is correlated with ecological frequency, but it's also affected by other factors. And I'll just point out that um, people can often uh, bring to mind highly frequent things that occurred. So use, using availability to make a judgment about how often something actually occurs is a reasonable approximation. But they also point out that the reliance on the availability heuristic can lead to systematic biases. And in their paper, their goal was to demonstrate, one, that people are sensitive to uh, how available information is to a person, how easy it is to bring things to mind. And they also show that the availability of information can bias judgments of frequency and probability. Let's take a look. 
So the big question and idea is similar to before. How do people judge frequencies and probabilities? The idea is that people use heuristics that are usually good approximations. And in this case, they're exploring the availability heuristic that people judge frequencies and probabilities based on how easy it is to think of particular examples. So if something's really easy, really available, just pops in your head, you might think, well, those things happen more often, or those things are more likely to happen. Here's a couple logical implications of this idea. One, if people use the availability heuristic, then decisions about frequency and probability should be biased by availability. And two, people should also be sensitive to self-assessments of availability. So we're going to look at a couple examples of research from the paper where they do some empirical demonstrations that show people are, one, sensitive to availability, and two, that availability can bias judgments of frequency and probability. Uh, the first two examples here are showing that people are sensitive to their own ability to generate examples. And I notice that we're at 26 minutes. We're, we'll probably go to 30 or 35, so apologies. I thought we'd get done in 25. Here's a simple experiment. You show people nine letters, like these nine here or these nine, and you give people two tasks. One, estimate how many words do you think you could make out of recombining these letters in two minutes. The word has to be at least three letters long, but you can just recombine these letters and make some words. So how many words could you make in two minutes by recombining these ones? Or how many words could you make in two minutes by recombining these ones over here? You get the estimates, and then you ask people to actually do the task. So now go ahead and make as many words as you can in two minutes. The result was that people had a very high positive correlation between the estimate and the actual number of words generated. So that means, like, maybe I looked at these ones here, and I said, oh, I can generate probably 40 words. That's a lot. And then I go ahead and I generate like 39 words or 45 words. So my estimate is close to uh, what I actually did. Maybe over here, I'd look at this and say, oh, I don't know. I don't know how many words I could get, uh, not very many. So I give a low estimate. And then it turns out when I actually try to make those words happen, I, I also don't make very many words. That's a high positive correlation. And I should point out that when people made this estimate, they did it very quickly, like in about seven seconds. So you just look at that really quick and you get a real kind of accurate sense of how many words you would become available to you if you tried to generate words from those things. Another version of this was uh, changing it from generating words to generating items from categories. So here participants were given category names like flowers or Russian novelists, and they had to estimate how many examples you could generate in two minutes, and then they had to generate those examples. So for flowers, it would be, you know, how many flower names can you come up with? And I would sit here and go, ooh, I don't know, maybe four, maybe more. Uh, and then I'd have to come up with like rose, dandelion, and so on. And maybe I'd run out at four because I've got a pretty good sense that I just don't know that many flower names. And again, they found a very high correlation between the estimate of how many words you could, uh, items you could generate and the actual number of examples generated. So the inferences uh, based on those studies was that one, people can, uh, they're apparently sensitive to the availability of examples, at least in these two scenarios. Two, people can quickly estimate whether they can produce many or few examples. And three, the estimates of availability correlated positively with how many examples people actually produced. So the next examples of uh, demonstrations, we're going to see how uh, the availability of information might bias a judgment about frequency. 
I think this is a fun study. Let's check it out. We have judgments of word frequency. So suppose you sample a word at random from English. Is it more likely that the word starts with a K or that K is the third letter in the word? Question mark. So according to their thesis, people answer such a question by comparing the availability of the two categories. That is by assessing the ease with which instances of the two categories come to mind. It is certainly easier to think of words that start with a K than of words where K is in the third position. So if the judgment of frequency is mediated by assessed availability, then words that start with K should be judged more frequent. They point out, in fact, a, a typical text contains twice as many words in which K is in the third position than words that start with K. Now they did a lots of versions of this Here's an example where they gave participants this text problem. They said, consider the letter R. Is R more likely to appear in the first position of a word or the third position of a word? And they had to estimate the ratio of these two values. Like for example, is it five to one or one to five or whatever it is. Turns out in the English language, R is actually more likely to appear in the third position of the word by a large margin. So that would have been the correct answer. What did people do? According to the results, out of 152 people, 105 judged the first position to be more likely for a majority of the letters, and 47 judged the third position to be more likely. The bias was there's a that's a pretty big bias and um, these they note that the results were obtained despite the fact that all letters were more frequent in the third position i like this example it uh yeah seems to give a lot of plausible evidence to the notion of the availability heuristic People make the decision based on the fact that they can easily generate words uh, that um, based on the first letter. It's harder to bring to mind words based on the middle letter. And so when people make the decision, they're being biased by the examples that are available to them. Here's a final example. So this one is fame, frequency, and Recall, participants here presented with a recorded list of names of known personalities of both sexes. And after listening to the list, some subjects judged whether it contained more names of men or women, and other participants attempted to recall the names in the list. So uh, some of the names were very famous. Richard Nixon, Elizabeth Taylor, others were less famous. William Fulbright, Lana Turner. Famous names are gener uh, generally easier to recall. So they're relying on this, uh, the fact that famous names would probably be more available to people. So if frequency judgments are mediated by assessed availability, then a class consisting of famous names should be judged more numerous than a comparable class consisting of less famous names. Here's how they made their lists. Four lists of names were prepared, two lists of entertainers, and two lists of other public figures. Each list contained 39 names. Uh, they were read out every two seconds. And let's just focus on this last part here. Two of the lists included 19 names of famous women and 20 names of less famous men. Notice what they did here. There's fewer women than men by, by one, but the women are more famous than the men. So we can anticipate they're expecting people will make the incorrect judgment that there was more women in the list. 
because they were more famous and easier to remember, even though there was fewer of them. They did the opposite for this other list. Uh, the two other lists contained 19 names of famous men and 20 names of less famous women. So for those lists, they'd be expecting people would say they had more men in those lists because those men, uh, they'd be biased to think about those men um, because they'd be easier to remember because of their fame. So what happened? Results. On average, for recall, subjects recalled 12.3 of the 19 famous names and 8.4 of 20 of the less famous names. So it was true that the famous names were easier, more available for memory. What about the judgments of frequency? Among the 99 subjects who compared the frequency of men and women in the lists, 80 of them erroneously judged the class consisting of the more famous names to be more frequent. So people's judgments of frequency were influenced by the availability of the examples. General takeaway is that cognitive processes such as learning and memory can influence judgment and decision making, and that basic memory processes make some examples easier to bring to mind, and people can be biased by the examples they are thinking about. If you're interested in learning more about the many other cognitive biases that I showed at the beginning, check out the optional writing assignment for this learning module, and that will uh, give you something to chew on. Don't forget, read the empirical paper for this learning module. It's short, it's pretty interesting, and it shows an application of judgment and decision-making research to the delivery room, where uh, the authors look at potential ways in which medical decisions might be biased by some of the things we're talking about today. So what's next? Take the quiz, complete any additional assignments. This right here is the last learning module of the semester. And the final exam will occur during the final exam week. I'm going to put more information about the final exam on Blackboard. This has been a fun semester for me. I know we've been online. We didn't get to meet in person. And so I just wanted to say a few things at the end of the course here. I'm going to go back to these slides. First of all, congratulations to you. Give yourself a congratulations for getting this far in the course. And, you know, it's hard to stay motivated. So I'm, I'm really proud. And that's my second thing. I'm impressed with your hard work and thoughtful reactions that I saw to a lot of the writing assignments. So some last words are, I hope to all meet you all someday in person and keep up the hard work and all the best in your future endeavors. I guess I like this gift from the uh, never ending story. We've got that magic dog talking to Atreyu. Never give up and good luck will find you. All right, see you next time. Oh, need to turn this off some.